everyone. Welcome to the Efficiency Engineers podcast, where we ask the question, is there a better way? My name is Fred, and in this podcast, I interview leaders in insurance that challenge the industry's notorious reputation of being slow to change and inefficient. On the show today, we have Manjit Rana. Manjit is a serial entrepreneur with a really impressive track record. He's probably the most down-to-earth and kindest person I've met so far on my journey. Needless to say, I'm super excited about the conversation we're about to have. We had a phone call recently, which was totally podcast worthy, if you ask me. With his latest startup, InsurTech Scout, Manjit aims to improve the efficiency of interactions between InsurTechs and insurers. Being an InsurTech selling to insurance ourselves, I personally feel the pain he's addressing big time. And I can say it's very real. So coming from a tech background, insurance is not the easiest industry to enter. I want to know, is there a better way? So Manjit, thanks for coming to the show. How do you feel today? Excellent. Yeah, really good. Looking forward to our conversation. How's your uh, week been so far? You, I know you're traveling around a lot from here and there. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy we were able to secure some time on Friday and I hope to make this like a relaxing thing before we head into the weekend. Yeah, sure. My weekends are never relaxing. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've just, come, I've just come back from San Diego. Um, so that, that was really nice, beautiful place. Um, and then came straight back into thunderstorms, rail strikes and everything else. But it, it, it's, it's been a little bit like uh, planes, trains, automobiles, 30 hours to get back. But hey. Um, Sounds here, stressful. So. so if I look at your if I look at your um, at your LinkedIn page, I uh, like my finger gets tired from scrolling through your uh, track <laughs> records. Um, it's because tell I'm us old. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> tell us, tell us a little bit. Well, it's unlike it's unlike other old people anyway. But uh, tell us a little bit. How does a typical week uh, looks like for you? Like what's what's keeping you busy? Is it are you working? Uh, full time on InsurTech Scout, uh, or yeah, what, what's what's it look like to be to be Manjit the professional? Um, gosh, um, my my days kind of start six seven in the morning, six or seven. So six if I'm in London, seven if I'm lucky enough to be in my Nottingham office where 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 I am today. Um, I'm generally working on a number of things at the same time. And by, by that, I mean, um, I have a consultancy business. So I have a number of clients, which can be an insurance company. Um, it can be another consultancy business that I'm helping out. Um, equally, it could be a technology company that's trying to do something in the insurance market. Um, or it could be an insure tech looking for advice. So during my day, um, gosh, what's my day? I'm typically getting two to 300 emails a day. I probably get a 50 plus LinkedIn messages, which I'm really bad at because I'm kind of addicted to trying to answer stuff as it comes in, which is a really super inefficient way to work. And then I'm trying to do Zoom calls, meetings. Um, the nice thing is it kind of works with my personality because I'm kind of a haphazard type of person. I, I, have a look, I have a very low boredom threshold, so I cannot focus on something for very long. Um, so if, if, even if I'm sitting in front of the TV in the evening, I kind of have to have my laptop there because watching a film kind of doesn't, doesn't do it enough for me. I have to be doing something. I have to be doing something else. So my days are like that. They're pretty haphazard, pretty crazy. My days are typically... 14, 15 hours at work. I'll go home, have something to eat. Um, and then I'm typically up till one, two o'clock in the morning, kind of finishing off emails that I've not, have not been able to do during the day. So it, it's pretty full on. Um, I probably don't have a life outside of, much of a life outside of work. Um, but then this, for me, this is like the best hobby in the world. So kind of like, why, why would I sacrifice doing this to go do something else that kind of doesn't appeal to me? So it, it, it is like, it, it is, I'm very fortunate in that 
I feel I have the best. I would do this even if I never got paid. So for me, that that then doesn't really feel like work. That's that's great. That's great. That's something you'd wish uh, you'd wish to everyone. But I I feel not not many people succeed uh, realizing it. You know, so when I get I I have a number of nephews and nieces, and they always say. Oh, you know, I need to go to university. You know, I'm going to university. I'm doing my A levels. What should I be studying? What should I do? And, and like coming from an Indian culture, Indian heritage, you know, it, it, we we have we put a lot of pressure on our kids. So, you know, you have to be a professional. You know, you, you've got to aim high. Um, but I always say to them, it doesn't really matter what you do, but pick something. You're going to wake up, at, wake up at six o'clock in the morning, dive out of bed and want to go do it, even if you didn't get paid. That's your number one criteria for what your career should be. And to, you're never going to know what that is until you go try it. So don't think, oh, I've, you know, because virtually every job is going to be disrupted in the future. You know, so if you're thinking you're going to be an accountant, well, we can outsource, you know, it's all done online. It can be outsourced to anywhere in the world. And we don't really need accountants sitting in Nottingham to work for Nottingham Company. So, you know, um, but the same applies to virtually every single. It can be a radiographer. You know, somebody in Australia can be checking your x-rays. They don't have to be checked here in Nottingham at the hospital. So those career choices you know, are, are going to have to change. So that's why I think if you're doing something you love doing, you'll always make money out of that and you'll always enjoy doing it. So, you know, that, so, you know, there's so many opportunities. So that kind of passed that back to that next generation. Whereas when I grew up, I was told, no, you have to be a doctor or you have to be a lawyer. No, or you have to be a dentist, which and none, none of those things ever appealed to me. So I, I, I was always going to refuse to do that. I think it's, it's part of a, let's say, a generational trend that there's more focus these days on like follow your passion create create your profession out of your passion uh some people succeed others don't some people say uh it's it's all a bit like overblown it's a bit of a romantic representation of of reality like jobs are still jobs now you're saying what you're saying did you always feel like this in your profession like did you know from the start the young manjit coming entering entering the the job life did you always know like, okay, this is what I'm set out to do uh, and I would do this for free as well? Or was this rather a journey that you developed? At, at what point At what point did you get into this? Okay, now I got it and I can keep doing this. Okay. Um, so we could probably use the entire podcast about this, but ju just to summarize. So I, I grew up literally like from the age of five or six, wanting to be a fighter pilot in the RAF. Don't ask me why. I've got no idea what triggered it, but that is what I wanted. To, as far back as I can remember, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and, and I was very motivated. So literally my entire, re my entire teenage life was spent on RAF stations, you know, with, with the cadets. Um, my family were pretty uncomfortable, let's say that, um, with me joining the RAF because they... they they had a view that if we ever go to war with India, I may end up dropping bombs on India. And I'm kind of going, but I don't know any different. You know, I'd not been to India, so it kind of, I didn't really connect myself to that, to that country, even though, even though I, I am, I am Indian. So, um, so I kind of went through this battle about the more they told me I can't do it, the more I was determined I was going to do it. Um, and then when the Falklands War was on, I was going through my officer selection process at Biggin Hill. Um, long and short of it, they made it, not the RAF, but the other candidates made it very clear that they didn't want me there. Um, read into that what, what, whatever, whatever you want. I was the only non-white, non-public school boy going through that process. Um, that kind of knocked me because that was somebody else determining what I can do with my career. So um, I, I came out of that saying, and they, they, they offered to sponsor me through university, the RAF offered to sponsor me through university. And I was kind of like, I'm not really sure I want to do this now because I've just fought to get here. And now you're telling me my colleagues are never going to have my back. 
and um and then so i my mum said to me well you have you have a couple of choices if you don't want to do that now be an airline pilot or train to be an airline pilot and i was like that's kind of like asking a formula one driver to drive a bus it's kind of not the same thing um and she said or apply to the indian air force so i wrote to the indian air force and they wrote back saying we don't accept foreign nationals and you're not indian so therefore you can't qualify so that kind of knocked me so i, I went to university kind of completely lost as to what i now wanted to do um so that was the, that was the first thing so i had no clue then what what i was going to do but um i committed to studying engineering and um commercial aspects of computing so i, I did that um and in in my placement in my work experience year out um um, I was meant to be at IBM for a placement that fell through because I asked a stupid question about what, what's my job going to be. And they said, well, basically you're collecting sales data from around IBM offices around the world, analyzing it, producing dashboards. And I went, oh, okay, wh where does the data come from? And they said, well, most of, the data, most of the data comes from the US. I went, okay, where do the reports go? And they went, actually, most reports go to the US. And I went, so why are we doing this in London? And they went, don't know, no one's ever asked that question. And then I got a letter a couple of weeks later saying we've decided that department needs to be, that function needs to be done in the US. We no longer have a placement really? for you. Yeah, so I, oh so I my talked God. myself out of a job before <laughs> I even got offered it. Um, and then I was kind of, so I had a, I, I had a year out. Um, my course was full, so I can go back to Polytechnic. Um, I had 500 pounds grants, because we used to get grants in those days rather than having to pay for everything. Um, and uh, you know, I, I said to my mum, what, what do I do? I've got a year out. I don't know when go bumming around the world. Um, and she'd just come back um, from Leicester, having done some shopping for Asian saris and stuff like that. And she went, well, there isn't one of these shops in Nottingham. So why don't you set up one of these? And I said, because I'm 19 years old. I know nothing about Asian fashion. I've never been to India. Like, this is crazy. But off the back of that, long and short story, so we set up an Asian fashion, the first Asian fashion business in Nottingham. Um, and I ran that for 18 months. Um, and the last six months, I was running that business and getting, and studying full time at university. But and then we sold that we sold that business. So I kind of got the bug for creating something out of nothing. Um, and, and that was that was such an interesting experience, because there was no guidebook. There was nothing to say, this is how you raise money. This is how you get a bank loan. This is how you set up a shop. This is how you negotiate a lease. Literally, and my, my, my dad was a bus conductor, so he couldn't help me. My mum used to um, sew anoraks on a sewing machine at home, so she couldn't teach me anything um, about this. So that kind of got me into the entrepreneur side. Um, and then my first job when I graduated, and by the way, once we sold the business, I finished my, I finished my degree. Um, and then I got offered a job working for a company called Mysis, OpenGI, um, as a PC support um, consultant. Um, and that's how I ended up in insurance. And then literally my career has, has kind of been a combination of problem solving, working for corporates, doing startups, um being innovative creatively problem solving so it's kind of been varied but because the majority of it's been in the insurance industry across all sectors i've kind of learned an awful lot had an opportunity to work on some amazing projects um and being generally at the very early stages of projects um uh, so kind of right at the point where someone's going we're losing <laughs> we're losing x amounts of money, how do we solve this problem? Um, and having the freedom to look at that problem in a different way to the way of kind of going, oh, but we've always solved it doing X, Y, Z. Um, and then because, because I'd had, <coughs> excuse me, the experience of doing a number of startups, I can kind of look at that problem from a very entrepreneurial perspective, as opposed to a corporate process perspective, I guess. So, so that's kind of made life really interesting for me. And it's meant that I've not been kind of constrained in 
what I do, what areas of the industry I work in, where I work, <coughs> and the kind of roles that I've had. And, and then along the way, I've, I, I've done... Um, so I'm in short tech guys, I'm a 12th startup. So I, I, I kind of love that early stage. How, how do you fix a problem? It, it's the bit I get, I get... So I'm not really motivated by the money. I'm more motivated by the fact that I kind of feel like I can find a creative way to solve a problem that nobody else has done, I guess. So that for me, that, that's motivated. If I have a, a tough nut to crack, now is a good time to ask because this is what you're, uh, what you're best at, what you excel at, or at least where you find the most enjoyment, which usually yes. leads to being good at something. Yes. So that, that's kind of that. If, if somebody said to me, what would you do as a hobby? That, that's my hobby. Yeah. Nice. It's, uh, it's funny. So I've, I've, I'm, I'm really uh, intrigued by how, uh, by stories of, of people entering the insurance industry by total coincidence like no nobody has this plan like no no kids kids want to be like air air um what, what's it called like raf fighter pilots uh but not kids don't dream of of be, being an insurance um like claims handler or or whatever so i'm, I'm really intrigued by the stories but then it happens that when people enter they they don't seem to leave the industry like people stay and and stay like for very long times and forever you don't have you you don't so much have this this inflow and outflow from different industries into insurance and and so on um it's yeah it's been it's been keeping me curious and i think the added problem is not only are are you know most of the time not only are we not attracting them in at the ground level we definitely don't attract them in at middle management level or a senior exec kind of level either. So if you look at other industries, you know, the, the head of marketing at Sainsbury's may previously have worked in a beauty makeup, you know, may, may have worked in boots or may have worked in, in a complete manufacturing industry or anything like that. So they, they have a lot of different perspectives on how you look at a problem. As an industry, we've kind of always struggled with that. To be fair, it's starting to change now because you know, some companies are actively trying to bring in people into those senior roles from outside of insurance. And just having that different perspective um, on the way that our, our business works and kind of how we create propositions, it, we're only just scratching the surface, though. And, and you're, you're right, you know, literally everybody almost everybody you talk to and you go, oh, how did you get any insurance? And, and then, to be fair, apart from the actuaries who, who seem to go to university knowing they're going to they're gonna be in this space, virtually everybody else says, oh, do you know what? I never intended this to be my career. I kind of fell into it and then never left. And so you're absolutely right. Um, but we have to change that, right? It, you know, I mean, this industry is fascinating. Um, and we have, we, but we, if we don't tell the world how fascinating it is, why would they want to come and work for us? But th th this, you know, th this is such a varied industry that there are so many things that you can do and, and they genuinely are fascinating. You know, when, when, you know I'm, I'm sure, you know, when I'm at dinner parties and I start talking about, um, well, actually, when, when I do lectures to university students, presentations rather than lectures um, and you you tell them hey you know you get introduced as, hey this is manager you know 30 years insurance experience you can kind of just see the body language of the room and it's almost like someone someone's pulled the air out of them and they're like oh god this is going to be shit um, like why did I sign up for this but within five minutes we've got them hooked because actually it no we we, we no, there's so there's so many opportunities, but we just don't. We, as an industry, we're not doing a great job at telling them about it, which is a shame. It's it's because you're you're cool, and then whenever you start uh, talking and explaining your stories, I'm sure you get those students hooked. But the uh, truth is, like we for me, insurance is is pretty new as an industry as well. I'm coming from the technology, like cloud and AI backgrounds, and um, and it's it's been very fascinating to get to meet so many people uh, in the insurance world and I've and I've been able to really connect 
or a lot of them on a, on a decent decent human to human level and it's been very enjoyable actually to get first into that industry where i also had this like preconception of i don't know this industry isn't it like isn't it boring isn't it slow and so on but that that said so i think i think it's full of uh great people lovely people that are that are very collaborative it's a very collaborative industry by nature as well i feel but on the other hand there's also this say behavior or trend where there's a lot of um incumbents would say hey this is this is how we've always done things and we know how this works so why would we do it differently or why would we listen to someone that knows close to nothing about our industry right it's it's addressing what what you already mentioned having those new ideas and getting those new new perspectives in at the same time for me it's been it's been uh, challenging as well to really wrap my head around the industry especially in different countries it's organized differently you have different different company structures different collaborations and so on so this yeah all of this is making it more difficult for incumbents to transform with technology they might not know so much about and then from for technologists to help them with that because we we're not speaking the same language and and uh, i assume this is this is part of of what led you to to create insurtech scout i think one of the so firstly the the you know the general thing that you know people don't say it but you know it's an underlying factor in their decision making you know um you know, this is how we've always done it. It works, but you know, what, why? Why do I need to change it? I, there's lots of reasons for that. Partly, you know, partly it's about what you're measuring people on. So, for argument's sake, if you're measuring me on how, you know, my team on how many claims we process, how quickly we process them, how cheaply we process them, why would I waste my time trying to disrupt that because I'm not being measured on it? You know, and we, we have um, a number of insurance companies that say to their staff, oh, we're going to adapt the, the Google method where you get 10% of your time available for you to go look at doing something completely different. Um, the problem is I, I still have 100% of my work still to do, or, or the perception is I still have to do that work. So what, you know, am I going to spend 10% 10, 10 of my time daydreaming about something else, or am I going to just get my work done, which is actually what I'm measured on paid on incentivized on so you know we, we're kind of not we're you know trying to copy companies like google for their culture we, we're not we're not really geared up for it and it's not like we're starting from scratch so it's quite difficult to to bring that culture into an organization when when we have quite fixed ways of of, of doing things um <coughs> excuse me so the you know, and, and generally, if you've done something for 15, 20 years in a particular way, it's quite difficult to kind of look at how it can be done in a completely different way. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so one of the very first InsureTech events that we created, gosh, um, I think it's probably nearly 10 years ago now. Um, so I, I made it a point that nobody on the stage could come from an insurance company. Um, so we had people like Google, Facebook, um, Shell was one of the companies, um, BMW um, presenting. But what we did was we gave them an insurance challenge. So Google were told, um, pretend you're an insurance company. We know you know nothing about insurance. Pretend you're an insurance company. What would your claims process look like? And their present that was their present that was their thirty minute presentation. That's what they had to do. Um, Facebook were told, pretend you're an insurance company. What does your what does your sales and distribution process look like? Present that to us. Uh, now, all of a sudden, because you don't understand how distribution works, you don't understand the fact that you have all these re regulatory constraints. You have you know distribution constraints because you know you can't upset. You know, the broker market and, and, and stuff like that, because you don't have those constraints, you can kind of start looking at the problem 
in a very different way. Um, and that's generally where innovation starts to come from. But if, if the minute you sit in a meeting and go, oh, let's kind of create, let's create a new product. Oh, but we can't do that because it's going to upset this part of the process. Or we can't do that. It, it's going to upset these people in, in the marketplace. Most people naturally go back to, okay, so what's the easiest way of getting to the solution? But it, it's almost like um, being in a tent pin bowling alley and kind of having the barriers up on the side you can never go outside of your lane because the barriers metaphorically mentally uh, just keep us back into that center lane the the way that you know the way the ball's kind of going whereas i i generally kind of think remove the barriers completely let's see what happens okay maybe you don't you know and, and you're not supposed to but maybe you're not knocking down your um pins at the end of your lane maybe you're wiping out the pins on the lane next to you but is the aim to wipe out the pins or is the aim to wipe out your pin? And who said the rule is you can only wipe out the pins that are in your lane? It, it, it's, it's just kind of opening your mind up to thinking about things in a slightly different way. And then kind of what can we now do as a result of thinking in, in that way? And then sometimes maybe you have to bring it back to reality, but at least you're, you're going to learn and be able to utilize things outside of you know, so you can be a little bit more free i i guess and, and and i just don't think we do enough of that this industry so what what would your advice no knowing this what would your advice be for me i've i have an open like an open mindset open open view um i i'm i'm trying to address the industries where the barriers are, are for for this for mindset and for um ideas are real I'm coming from a technology background, so I'm I'm here. Uh, technology, uh, new ideas. Let's let's solve. Let's make things better. Uh, we've done this in the past and others in industries. Now let's let's do this at for insurance. What will your advice be to me? Like things I might be missing today to be successful on that mission. Okay, so I I kind of think um, find the organizations or the individuals that are suffering the most pain that you're able to address. So I, 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 let, let me kind of break that down a little bit for you. So lots of people, um, lots of people will be whinging when, when they've got a little splinter in their finger, right? Excuse my French, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're bitching and groaning and moaning, oh, this thing's in there, you know, it's, it's real pain. Are they seriously going to do anything about it? Not when there's a million other things around that, that are taking their attention. Find the guy who's literally just cut through his wrist, and this, this is horrible, but there's blood spurting everywhere. Guess what? That guy is no longer worried about how things are normally done. He, he doesn't care what the cost is to get that, get his hand back on his wrist again, right? That pain is so bad. He will consider anything as an option at that point. And all of them, but this is not the way we fix hands back onto arms. That goes out of the window. He, he doesn't, excuse me, he doesn't care, right? He just wants that problem solved and he wants it solved right now. You have to find those kind of people that relate to the solution that, that you're able to deliver. So um, in, in a marketing sense, you create, um, I don't know, let's say you create a, a car, um, you know, using a non-insurance analogy. Um, you've created a car and you go tell the world you've created a car. But if most of those people work a quarter of a mile from where they live, they don't care that you've got a car, that you've created a car. They're not interested. Um, but you kind of go, you've got to tell the world about it. Um, so you really have to find the people that have got the problem. Now, how do you do that? You know, you know, when you're trying to do marketing, that's a really expensive way for you to take out billboard adverts, ad advertising, social media, blah, blah, blah. Isn't it more, isn't it, if you could create a scenario where only the people that, that work 50 miles away from where they live can kind of go, hey, I, I have a real problem because I can't walk this distance. Um, I'd be really interested in a more efficient way. Um, to find a way of getting from home to work. 
So now they've, they've told you that they've got that problem. Then they're the people that you should go talk to. Now, in the metaphoric, no, metaphorically speaking, how do you create that kind of scenario? And if you could create that kind of scenario, does it make marketing far more efficient? You'd also, you'd also like, you, so would you'd live in that same example, you'd live in a world where most of the people have jobs close to their home because no one is driving a car. Uh, and then you come to market with a car, but you'd have to educate people that they can actually take jobs that are much more, much better for them, that are further from their houses and then take the car. Right. So yeah, it's, it, it wouldn't be blood gushing out of their wrists yet because they they're doing things differently still like they're doing things in an older world which is which is how at least how i see insurance today but i might be so that the challenge for me is if i for example i explain i tell people about our value proposition proposition and what we're doing and and obviously i know it's not perfect but sometimes i do feel like hey we're addressing a pain that they are feeling but then not much happens so i'm thinking like is it is this a a mindset thing is this a well, let's say I, 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 yeah please so go I, I was going to say so the my, my reaction to that is if they're not reacting or they're not responding you you haven't got to someone for whom that pain is big enough or or, or they are not motivated enough to solve that problem that, that, that's it you know it, it's a, it's a you now I, I, i'll give you another quick example so you know, when i was working for one of the brokers you know the broker software houses and my sales guys used to come and say oh we've gone out we've done this demo um we've gone through the whole sales process um and the broker is saying he can't afford he can't afford to buy the system he, he just doesn't have the money um and you go well how much was it and, and then back in those days it was kind of like 20k for for a broken platform um and I'd go to the salesperson, like, seriously, you're telling me they can't afford to invest 20K in the best insurance broking platform in the marketplace. And sales guys would be, yeah, absolutely. So I'd pick the phone up um, and I hope none of the insurance brokers from back in those days remember this, but I'd, I'd pick the phone up, I'd ring, you know, randomly and I'd say to them, hi, my name's Manchit, you, you know, you won't know who I am, but... Um, I have a friend who's just bought a Ferrari. It's like a hundred thousand pound car. It's literally a week old. Um, his wife has gone completely nuts because he spent this money on a Ferrari. So he really has to get rid. Um, he's prepared to take 80K for it. And you know, I've heard on the grapevine that you may be interested in something like that. Um, would it be of interest? And most of the time, in fact, you know, virtually every time, they'd go, what, 100K Ferrari for 80-odd K? And I'd say, yeah, is it, is it worth me introducing you? And they'd go, absolutely, I'm, I'm up for that. And you go, okay, I'll come back to you, put the phone down. <laughs> and you turn around to sales guys, so that guy who couldn't find 20K has just told me he's prepared to spend 80. I don't really care where he's going to get the money from, but he's just told me he can get 80K. So the problem wasn't that he couldn't afford the 20K. The problem was you didn't convince him the value of what he's buying or investing in is way, way, way more than 20K. That's the difference. Um, I don't know how we, how we got down that. So yeah, in, in terms of, you know, if somebody's, if you're taking something to a potential prospect and they're saying to you, yeah, um, you know, we, we, you know, maybe we, we talk again in a few weeks um, or they're not interested or they're not, not pursuing it. It's because that problem's genuinely not big enough. They, 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 don't, you know, they feel what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is more important than what you're bringing to the table. And, and, and it goes back to that analogy, right? You know, if, if I've got a splinter, I can live with it for a couple of days. <laughs> if, if I literally have blood spurting out, trust me, nothing else matters. And you know, if, if there's a surge, yeah, if the if the surgeon's sitting there saying, I can fix that problem for you, but I can fix it right now. I, I am not going to delay having that conversation. Yeah. 
So let's talk a little bit about the insured tech scout. I uh, I read. Yeah, I was going to say morning. let's let's get away from the let's get away from the gory from all the blood. Yeah, it's, it's just just <laughs> been Halloween, but uh, this this fits in the team. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I I registered to to insured tech scout uh, this morning. Uh, it's it's supposed to be able to help me connect better with the insurance industry, like bringing insured techs and insurers uh, closer together. How how would that work? Like what's What's the next step I should take or what can I expect? Sure. So, um, so let, let, let's kind of just go back a, a step. So um, I, I've had an innovation consulting business for um, 12, 13 odd, odd years. So um, during COVID and during the lockdown, I kind of sat down and said, OK, how, would I, how do I disrupt that model? Um, so I kind of went through each segment, customer segment. So typically I have five segments of customers, have insure techs, insurers, investors, independent advisors, and then what I call adjacent industry. So the likes of um, IKEA, BMW. Um, so ignore those. But everybody else generally comes to me with four or five common problems that they're trying to address. So if it's an insure tech, it's generally things like, hey, can you help me validate my proposition? Um, or why am I not getting the attention, same as you described? Um, or which insurer should I be talking to? Or, hey, can you help me get into Zurich? Um, or can you help me raise some money? So, that, you know, very, very typical, 80 odd percent of insure tax approach may typically come to me with a variation on, on those things. Insurance companies come to me with, Things like, hey, can you give us an overview of what's happening in the insure tech space? Um, we're losing X million pounds on mobile phone fraud. Can you think of a way how you can help us solve that problem? Um, you know, so generally kind of you know, help, help us solve the problems that, that we're, we're, we're experiencing. Investors typically come along and go, hey, who's, who's really interesting out there at the moment? And I go, well, I don't know what that means. Go, you know, which insure tech's got a really compelling story that we should be talking to? Um, and I kind of say, well, you might as well ask me what's the best restaurant in the UK. I'll, I'll have an opinion, but it's going to be very different to your opinion because I kind of don't know what setting you like. I don't know what location you like. I don't know what kind of food you like. Um, but it's subjective because what I think is interesting may not be what you think is interesting, um, et cetera. So that was my start point. And I thought, OK, how do I... How do I solve those problems if I wasn't there? Yeah. So how, how could these people, how could this community self-serve and, and, and address these issues? So we literally sat down, mapped it, mapped it out, um, and we basically created a digital, digital collaboration platform, essentially, probably the best way of describing it. Um, so I, I kind of describe it as LinkedIn on steroids combined with Match.com and fantasy football and, and kind of why, why those things. Um, LinkedIn on steroids, because it's about you taking ownership of your profile um, and it's about communicating. Um, so that, that's kind of why that works. But it, but it has to be a lot more extensive than just LinkedIn. Otherwise, that kind of why would you just not stick to using LinkedIn? Match.com, because a big chunk of this problem is about matching. But on a dating site, you don't match based on physical attributes, typically. You know, well, people don't go in to match. On a, you, know, you don't go, oh, show me all the people that are this height, you know, this color eyes. You know, generally, people, people are expected to find somebody with a really nice personality that they can engage with. Someone's going to be fun to date. You can't search for those factors. You can't search in, in a database. They show me it, all the people that are going to be fun to go out with. You know, that, that, that's very subjective. So it, it, it's a similar, the matching thing is a similar problem to dating. Um, and then to keep, to keep things going, rather than people just coming in. So rather than like on LinkedIn, I only go into LinkedIn when I, when I have a particular problem I'm trying to solve, or there's a particular person I'm trying to engage with. I kind of have to make it addictive and I kind of have to make it more engaging. So I'm in and out of the platform all the time. So things like fantasy football, they're all gamified where 
um, you know, for the way that I behave on the platform, I earn rewards, virtual currency. I, I can then spend that money um, to, you know, to, to get to get value out, out of the platform. Um, so we've kind of incorporated all of those into a single platform. So now, what what do you so interpret? <laughs> the question was, what do I get out of being on this platform? So a you can use the platform to raise your profile. So rather than, um, but I can tell you, or rather the platform can tell you which insurers are looking at your profile. Where are they from? What roles are looking at your platform? Um, so that's the first thing. So now instead of reaching out to every insurer, you can see which insurers are already interested in what you're doing or which insurers are searching for things where you are popping up. So now we've, we've narrowed down who you should be talking to. But we're also doing that from investors' perspective as well. So you can see which investors are, in, are looking at what you're doing. You may not even be looking for money, but the fact that you know which investors are looking at you, maybe you want to start opening that conversation up. Um, and maybe you have challenges. You know, Maybe you're sitting there going, <coughs> right now, I just want to talk to the chief underwriting officer at AXA. So that, that's your immediate challenge, right? How do you fix that challenge? What you did, go talk to a marketing agency and say, um, hey, can you do, this, do me a campaign to help me get in front of this individual? Well, that, that's not a cost-effective thing to do. Or you can post that as a problem on the platform. You can do it, and all of these things you can do anonymously, or you can do it kind of like, hey, this is me. Um, and then if there's a bunch of independent consultants um, and I, I, you know, maybe as, as a consultant, I go, hey, I'm ex axa I know who the chief underwriting officer is. I, I can connect you. Um, so all of a sudden, the person that you really want to talk to about solving your problem is me, not the 50,000 other people that you could be talking to. But it, it's about how you kind of make those connections. So that's what the platform is designed to do. Make those connections, look at the process of how you do business, and then just streamline it. Make it more cost effective so that you're not wasting an awful lot of time. But to be fair, to make that work, you kind of need every part of the every part of that ecosystem to connect. And, and to be fair, there's no secret that is our biggest challenge. Because we're always going to have the situation where insurers go, oh, we'll come onto the platform when you have enough insure techs. How many insure techs have you got? Um, and investors are always going to say, hey, we'll come and use your platform when there's enough insure techs that, that want to raise money. It, it, it's a classic um, cold market cold, cold start problem. And, 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 that, and you know, yeah, but you know, LinkedIn had that problem. eBay had that problem. Amazon had that problem. If you crack it, you, you, change, you change the market. But that problem doesn't just exist in insurance. It exists in every industry and no one's really fixed it, which is kind of... Which kind of comes back to what motivates me. I'm solving a problem that I don't think anybody else has really cracked. And if I solve it, I get the personal satisfaction that I've done that. Do I really care what, what that business is worth three, five years' time? It'd be nice. It would be nice if it was worth some of the valuations that other insure techs have had. But that, that's kind of not what drives me. What drives me is the fact that I'm solving a problem that at the moment frustrates a lot of people and no one's really no one's really fixing it um so it makes me think about uh, the platform and what, what you were just saying and take it with a grain of salt because i haven't actually worked in the platform yet so i, I don't know it uh so this is this is unsolicited advice but um well the, the reason why we are doing this podcast is because we believe that every company will become or should become a media company to be relevant if you're, everyone is fighting for people's attention. Like how, how do you want, you're, you're talking about driving usage of your platform. Nobody has time to use another tool. Like no, in general, just no one has extra time. However, the reality is that people spend loads of time on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn. However, um, I'm, I'm very big into getting very big into LinkedIn since this summer. I'm, I'm consuming a lot of content through it. Uh, but I'm also wondering, is it the best place to organize content and especially like, like focused content? If you, if you know your audience really well, like 
I don't know, some maybe maybe there's an opportunity in, in how content is consumed, how content is shared. Uh, but again, this is completely like with with no experience with your platform whatsoever. So uh, but that's that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I mean, so I spend honestly between an hour and a half to two hours every single day on LinkedIn. That, that that's a lot of time. But what, what, why do I do that? It's because 80% of my consulting revenue comes from that source. So it, 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 you know, it, it's addictive because that's, that's where I get projects from. Um, but a lot, a lot of people know that's the best, best way to reach me as well. It's, more, it's easier to reach me via LinkedIn than it is to reach me via email. So a lot of the messages I get come, come through that channel. Um, now, be, be, because of that, that, that I have to engage with it. Because if, if I don't touch it for, for like two, three days, you know, A, I'll miss a bunch of messages that, that are generally reasonably important, um, but I've lost opportunities. So, I, I, you know, do, do I use Facebook? No, you know, I'm on Facebook, I don't, I don't use it. Do I use TikTok? Do I, any, no, because they're not relevant. They add no value to what I'm doing. But there are a whole load of constraints in terms of what I'm able to do on LinkedIn. It's amazing for the part of the problem that it's, it's designed to address. It kind of needs to be, it needs to be bigger than that. It needs to be more than that. And they're not, right now, that, that's not, you know, so for instance, um, why don't I have my data room in LinkedIn? So if an investor wants to look at my pitch deck or they want to look at my financials, um, I can give them access for to a document or, or to the entire data room for a day or 24 hours or something. Now, logically, when an investor's talking to me, that's the next thing that's going to happen, right? They're going to say, oh, can you send us your pitch deck? Well, I, I emailed them my pitch deck. Then what? What, what do I do now? I, I ring them and I ring them and I ring them and I kind of go, hey, I sent you my pitch deck. What happened with it? And they go, oh, yeah, the team's looking at it. Can I talk to your team? No, no, no. If we're interested, we'll come back to you. So that, that process is now for, you know, yes, we connected, you know, if it was via LinkedIn, but the whole process then when it went to the manual route kind of became completely inefficient. Whereas in our platform, we, we fix that problem. Um, we make it easy um, for you to be able to see in, investors and organizations that are looking to raise money, how, how they how they interact far more efficiently than they're able to do. And it's, it's the beauty of, of technology is none of this stuff is impossible to do. Because you, know, you, you, can, you can do stuff with technology so quickly, so easily. Um, it's about thinking about the process and going, how do I remove all the barriers? How do I remove that friction that enables those two parties to be able to get to their end goal quickly, super quickly? Whether that's a positive outcome or a negative outcome, but let's get to the outcome in hours rather than months, because that, that's a far more efficient way to be able to do business. And now, as we're going into recession, this is going to become even more important because no one's got the time, energy, resources to spend weeks reaching out to a ton of insurance companies, 80% of who go, this is just not a big enough problem for us. It should be, but it, but right now it's just not a big enough problem for us. But you've wasted all of your sales and marketing effort to get that answer. Well, how about we eliminate you having the need to talk to those people because actually they're not they're not a target market for you um, right now. They may be six months a year down the line, but right now they're not, they're not the right target market for you. So how do we get you to the people that are the right target market for you? And and that that I, I guess it's. And, and there's going to be a number of these problems that are going to keep happening. So when we fix one, something else is going to pop up and we have to think, okay, do we solve that problem? Is it big enough? So we, we, you know, we, we have to apply that thinking to ourselves as well in, in the way that we, because, you know, developing that platform is expensive. So there's no point in building functionality that, that isn't, no one's going to use, that's not relevant. That's what they. That's what they say, right? Is how to. This is the entrepreneurial mindset, like being a problem solver and like starting out with like things you see in your daily life and that you think 
could be done differently, that could be done better. This is how you start this ID generating reflex, so to so to say. But but it's it's also how you experiment. It's also how you experiment as well, because we can do the theoretical thing about what, in theory, what's the most efficient way of being able to do this. You know, it, it's kind of like me asking a number of people, "Hey, would would you love the idea of having a flying car?" I'm pretty sure most people will go, "Shit, yeah, of course, I I would." In reality, is it practical for them for most people to use it? Is it practical for most people to be able to afford it? Probably not. So the only way that we can actually get to those real answers is to experiment, create something, stick it in front of them. They go, actually, do you know what? I like this, but I don't like that. Or I like this, but it doesn't work. You know, I didn't realize I, I have to have a hundred foot drive to be able to take off from or what what whatever. Um, but you would never have, you would never have known that um, until you've actually said, you know, and, and um, just quick, you know, what I, I, I did have a dating business back before smartphones. We were using a Russian games console um, to basically do Tinder inside a nightclub. Um, so we, we launched the product. The first night, um, we kind of all, we had 500 units in this nightclub. Um, we're looking at each other kind of going, but no one's using them. And we suddenly realized, A, we'd never tested this in the dark because we, we built everything. And this is how stupid it is, right? We built the whole proposition in, a, in an office, a lit office. We never turned the lights down to see if it would work in the dark. And it, unfortunately for us, the damn unit didn't have a backlit screen. So you couldn't see anything in the dark. Um, secondly, it had a rubberized keyboard. And when you're building this thing, you've got the unit in one hand and you can use your other hand to type. But in a nightclub, most people have got the unit in their, in their left and a hand drink. and they've and got a drink. a drink in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how the hell do you use this? Because <laughs> nightclubs don't want you to put your, nightclubs don't want you to put your drink down anywhere because they want you to drink it and then go to the bar to get another one. They don't want you to leave it on the side. You know, we, we could have spent two years thinking and imagining every single scenario and then trying to create the perfect product. But what we chose to do was create, you know, the, the terminology minimal viable products. We put it out into the marketplace and we, we started learning stuff right from the very first day. And then, then we went about addressing the problems. But what we didn't do was address a ton of problems that nobody even raised. And there were a ton of problems, but we didn't need to think about them because nobody, nobody had an issue with them. Um, so, you know, for me, when, when you're when you're doing something entrepreneurial, you're doing something innovative. It's about experimenting, and, and then no, nobody in that team, you know, stood there in the nightclub on that first day and went, "Oh, screw this! We, we completely effed up because there's no backlit screen. We can't use a rubberized keyboard." Nobody said, "Oh, this was a complete failure. What a nightmare!" Everybody was focused on, "Okay, now our challenge is how do we fix them." Now, even to the point where, honestly, this is how stupid it was. Nobody realized that these things run out of battery within 24 hours. And then how do you charge them? Well, you have to plug them into the wall. Who, who has 500 power sockets to plug these things in to charge them up? So we were literally running around buying every four-way um, extension lead that you could find in the East Midlands. So we could literally daisy chain them all together to, to have all these units charging overnight. Not the most sensible thing to do, but that was the most practical way to get 500 units charged ready for us to be able to use on the following Friday. But that's experimentation. And then you learn, and then you find a more robust way to solve that problem. But you have to solve it, you have to solve it quick and dirty first, and, and then worry about how you industrialize it. And the problem is, Generally, as an industry, we're trying to create the perfect solution before we even put it out into market because we're a risk adverse industry. Yeah, we, we don't we don't want to take risk. Yeah, we don't want to take risks. We want to eliminate them before we start. And everyone supposedly has the perfect solution to like the biggest problem, and and this makes it very difficult to communicate like in an honest way. And 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 there's not there's no let's say. 
there's also not a habit. It goes both ways, right? There's not a habit of like evaluating a product and giving feedback. No, rather it's, I don't know, some sort of awkward silence, like, okay, maybe, maybe this is just a splinter. So let's get back to our day to day. It's also the cultural difference between like US in short text compared to European in short text as well. Um, in the US, they'll launch with a much inferior product and they kind of take that approach. Okay, it's not perfect. We know it's not perfect. It's not meant to be perfect. Let's put it out there. Let's see what the customer reaction is and then we'll start fixing the stuff the customer's complaining about. Whereas here in Europe, we, we try and think through every possible scenario. So I, I remember having a conversation with, um, I won't name the insurers, um, you know, so when we were trying to do um, telematics on a smartphone. You know, the view was, this will never work because you can't control if the consumer has the phone in their pocket or not. And you're going, seriously, guys, how often does a consumer leave their phone at home? One in a thousand times. But it was like, oh, but, but it's still a risk. What if they turn their phone off? And you go, hang on, no, nobody in their right mind gets in a car and says, I think I'm going to drive like a bit of an idiot today. Let me just turn my phone off first. That's <laughs> not the way people behave. So, but those were reasons why a lot of insurers did not want to use um, smartphones for doing telematics, even though the technology in the smartphones is way, way, way more sophisticated than in a black box. The sensors are way more accurate because you've got a phone that's a thousand pound piece of kit. The black box in your car is like 50 pound piece of kit. So clearly we, we can do a lot more stuff on a smartphone, but that was the view, right? Um, we can't possibly use this because there are some risks. Clearly there are, but the, you know, um, how do we work around them? So it was that lack of wanting to experiment that was that slowed us down and, and but what what did covid do now covid forced us into looking at paper journey insurance because customers were now starting to challenge why they're paying an annual premium for a car that's not being used most of the time so we had we had to all of a sudden come up with quick and dirty solutions which will now get better and more sophisticated but we had no option and and it's and it's it's that that mentality we have to experiment to be able to get to something that, that ultimately works. Um, we, can't, we can't aim to create the most perfect thing on day one because we don't know what we don't know. This is, this is exactly what we were talking about earlier. I've also talked about it with, a, with another guest. This is, this is the mindset kind of problem. And, and, and I do hope that like with COVID now slightly passing, there's a recession coming. I mean, things are in motion, right? That we don't just as as an industry fall back into those yeah rigorous habits of of not trying not daring to try it's about having courage and, and not daring to try i think what it has ha what it has done though is accelerated the pace at, so where we are today it, it, we, we've probably got there in two years and where we we probably would have taken five or seven years to get to so if nothing else, even if the mindset doesn't change, which I hope, genuinely hope it does, but even if the mindsets don't change, we're still further ahead than we would have been. So that's, that's a positive, right? So that's, we, that is most a insurance would not, would, Yeah, most insurers would not, would not be entertaining paper, journey, um, car insurance, but now virtually everybody is. So that, that can't be a bad thing. No. To close this, uh, to close this uh, session, Manjit, uh, I have one more question for you. Let's make it a, a short and snappy answer. But so every, many people know know uh, you. You know many people. I'm starting to get to know you a little bit. Tell me one thing that people don't generally know about you that might surprise us. I feel you're a very authentic person, so I think people get just you in general, like all of you. Yeah, I, I I kind of don't hide away, and you know I'm, I'm me. You, you know I am I am what you see. Um, 
Well, okay, so one thing that might surprise you, um, and we, we kind of touched on this um, when, when, you know, earlier when we had a previous conversation. Um, I've started becoming more interested in destiny and kind of what, what you, you know, is your life actually mapped out from the day you're born? Um, which is, which is a, a very big topic, and, and, and I know you wanted a short answer. So um, I'm, now, I'm now getting more and more curious about that because the more I dig into it, the more evidence I get that there is, a, there is an element of truth in that. So that's making me very curious right now. And, and it's probably not what any of the people knowing me would never associate me with thinking that way. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It does. Absolutely. And I find it super intriguing. Like this is philosophical discussions are my favorite. It's, it's good fun. You it's like allowing the creativity of the brain, try to answer questions that we can't really answer anyway. Um, yeah. so I, I think that's, that's and, great. And, and there's, so, there's so much we can't explain exactly. so much in this world. We can't explain. Maybe maybe that's a hook for uh, whenever we uh, find ourselves in another chat, um, which I would love I'd to, love and I'd, I'd, I'd really look forward to that because uh, this has been great, Manjit. I really appreciate your uh, your time, your your authenticity, your kindness, and uh, allowing us to 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 get to know your story as well, which I found really fascinating. And uh, we'll we'll speak soon. I'm gonna test out Introtech Scout. I'll uh, I'm ready to um, as you also indicated this. For me, the work is, is mostly around really working harder on our messaging positioning. Like, are we solving the blood gushing or is it just a splinter? And that's the qualifier for um, the next steps we'll take with paper books. Uh, so thank you so much for this. And, and, and gen gen genuinely, if there's anything I can do to help, give me a shout. Really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs>